Right, good morning and welcome to this Euractive online event titled Ammonia, the missing link in the hydrogen story, which is kindly supported by Fertilizers Europe. My name is Frédéric Simon, I'm the Energy and Environment Editor of Euractive, and I will have the pleasure of moderating today's discussion. Now, allow me to introduce today's topic with a confession. Only a few weeks ago, I had absolutely no idea that ammonia could be used to carry hydrogen, or even that it could be used as a fuel in its own right. My limited understanding of it was that it was used in the production of fertilizers, and that was about it. But as this discussion on hydrogen now picks up at the European level, it's probably worth taking a second look at ammonia and explore the opportunities it offers as well as the challenges it faces in the EU's drive to decarbonize the energy system. So to discuss this topic today, let me welcome Tudor Constantinescu, Principal Advisor at the European Commission's DG Energy, Jutta Paulus, a German Green MEP who sits on the Parliament's Environment Committee, David Herrero Fuentes from Fertiberia, a Spanish fertilizer company, and Berit Hinnemann from Maersk, the Danish shipping company. Welcome to all of you and thanks for joining us today. We'll start this conference uh, with a short opening statements from the speakers and then we'll move on to a Q&A session that will also include some questions from the audience. And let me also uh, point out that we have prepared a series of uh, online polls for the audience. So watch your screen. We'll be sending you questions over during the conference. If you can take a few minutes to answer, we'll then uh, take a bit of time to uh, explore uh, the implications. Right, I think that's all for me. Tudor Constantinescu, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, first of all, for the, for the invitation. And uh, I have to say I'm very pleased to, to see this interest uh, in one of the areas for, uh, for hydrogen. Let me start uh, just briefly to put this into the context. And the, the context at European level is absolutely the Green Deal. The Green Deal with uh, the objective uh, expressed by our president uh, on the line to have by 2030 uh, uh, carbon emission reduction of 50 to 55 percent. And this is something more ambitious than we had in the past. And I think everything comes actually from here. This is the root of uh, many developments and many opportunities we are going to have, because what this means is that uh, instead of postponing a number of actions after 2030 to reach the long-term decarbonization, which we have already analyzed before, we have to take action now and to do more investments in uh, in the next years. And doing more investment in these in this next years is also what it helps the recovery. And the Green Deal is actually helping the economic recovery, which uh, happened now to be so important because of the health crisis. And in this context, of course, we need to look at all the technologies and all the options. The Commission came recently in July with two communications, one on energy system integration and somehow almost derived from it on hydrogen, because hydrogen is one of the key enablers for this energy system integration, or what it was sometimes called sector integration. In, in the strategy, we clearly put a focus on renewable hydrogen, and it's clear that if we want to achieve long-term diagonalization, this is essential. And uh, we notice that while electricity now is uh, only 23% of our final energy consumption, by 2050 will be 50%, but still, or in the range, about half of the final energy consumption will be in the form of gases and liquid fuels. And it's important to decarbonize them as well, these gases and liquid fuels. And this is where hydrogen plays a very important role and all the fuels derived from hydrogen and uh, in this respect uh, ammonia is definitely one of them and it's not only one of them in this respect but it's also one of them for the fertilizers industry currently about 80 percent of the hydrogen of the ammonia produced in europe is used by the fertilizer industry so it's it's a uh, it's very uh, is a very important sector and where hydrogen can support de facto decarbonization. In the hydrogen strategy, we pointed uh, uh, to, to 
the various actions we need to take in, in terms of uh, promoting uh, renewables, in terms of boosting demand and scale up production, in terms of developing a supportive framework and, uh, and market rules uh, in, in, this, uh, in this field, on research and innovation, but also on how to position Europe internationally. And definitely, Ammonia finds a place in this. As I said, first of all, we identified this in, in its role to support decarbonizing the fertilizers industry and i have to say that ammonia represents almost half of the uh, uh, use of hydrogen today so it's one of the most important uses and we need to take uh, this to account and this indicated in our strategy is also one of the first priorities in uh, upscaling the demand for renewable hydrogen so uh, another area identified is for shipping and uh, ammonia is important for shipping and for maritime applications, in particular for long distance, where it can be competitive. But it's also important as an energy carrier in itself. And it's important as an energy carrier to transport hydrogen at long distances. And it's also important to store hydrogen. And the opportunities uh, ammonia offer for storing large amounts of renewable electricity, it's uh, quite high. And it's something which deserves further uh, analysis and also further action in this respect. And we are uh, trying to, to cope with this and to work on these opportunities. So I think uh, we identified ammonia quite clearly in, in, in the strategy, or you know, the hydrogen strategy, and we see big opportunities uh, while it's clear that a lot of actions will have to be taken. And you see part of the complexity is that the uh, Energy system integration means we have to take actions on all the parts, starting with uh, renewables, of course, because this is, they will be at the uh, root of all decision and decarbonization of the energy system. This is just to introduce uh, the topic from, from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tudor. Let me uh, now pass the floor to Jutta Polis for some introductory remarks. Jutta Polis, you have the floor now. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Um, actually, thank you very much, Tudor, for pointing out that we need, in first time, we need a lot more renewables in order to be able, actually, to um, deploy any alternative fuels. Because, as you said, hydrogen stands at the, at the first step. Um, of any alternative fuel and we need much more renewable electricity in order to be able to produce green hydrogen because um, the way hydrogen is produced today mostly from fossil fuels we have a lot of co2 um, emissions stemming from hydrogen production and when methane is used as um, as a base substance we also have the methane emissions of the feed chain um, and methane is much more um, climate detrimental than CO2, the factor is about 87 on a time period of 20 years. So we must um, phase out methane use in hydrogen production as soon as possible. Um, I have looked at, at ammonia as an energy carrier um, for two, three, four years now, looking for how can we actually transform our energy system, needing chemical carriers, of course, for certain uses. And I would like to shortly look at the, at the chemical properties of ammonia. Um, ammonia is corrosive, ammonia is toxic, ammonia is a flammable gas, and it's very harmful in the environment. It has alkaline properties, of course. And we have a second challenge at ambient temperature and pressure, it's gaseous. So it's not so easy to store ammonia in um, in any fuel tanks or something as it is with liquid energy carriers. So we have to look at how do we actually store it? Will we apply pressure like nine times ambient pressure to keep it in the tank? Or will we liquefy ammonia through cooling where we need about minus 33 degrees Celsius? Today we have approximately two or three percent of fossil fuel consumption going into ammonia production, mainly for fertilizers, as has been said. Um, so the good news is that we already have the technology and we already have the production facilities for ammonia. So that production could be ramped up 
quickly. And of course, we should also look at alternatives to the Harbour Bosch procedure, which needs a lot of energy. And um, when we ramp up ammonia production for energy uses, we should maybe also look at maybe alternative um, alternative catalysts, which have been in, in research and development for quite a while. Um, let's come back to toxicity. At workplaces in Germany, 20 ppm parts per million are permitted in, when people are working in places where ammonia is used. That's, of course, especially chemical plants. And the good thing is that it has a very strong smell, so people are more or less warned when ammonia is set free, but still regularly people are hurt um, through workplace accidents. Although we have very high security standards, we have very well-skilled workers, but still as it is so harmful to lung and eyes, we still have those accidents. And that would be especially um, where we should put our focus um, whenever we try, we are thinking of applying ammonia uses to other sectors. I'm thinking, of course, of shipping, where um, during my research um, as a rapporteur for the shipping emissions file, which will be voted on in plenary next week, um, I spoke to quite a few researchers, but also to ship owners, ship operators, and they said, well, we want um, an alternative fuel which does not endanger our sailors and our workers. They are not used to handling toxic chemical substances um, by default. So it's, they would have to be skilled, they would have to be employed um, workplace security options on ships, for example, and also in ports, where, of course, we would also need um, an infrastructure that makes it possible to actually use ammonia as a fuel. You cannot use the, the bunker fuel um, stations, you cannot use the LNG terminals because ammonia has so different properties. So these are technical challenges which would be present if we wanted to deploy ammonia as a fuel on a large scale. Um, and I had something else, sorry. Yes, of course, we would also need the pipelines or other means of transport in order to bring the ammonia to those places where it would be needed as an alternative energy carrier. This would also um, need a lot of investment. The energy density of ammonia is much lower than that of our um, carbon fuels. For, for example, if you compare it to gasoline, it's about 50%, approximately the same as methanol. But um, in opposition to methanol, it does not contain carbon. So it's easier to um, use ammonia as an energy carrier for hydrogen because you don't have to have a carbon source for that. But at the same time, of course, we would have to put much more research and development in developing a fuel cell technology for ammonia, which does not exist at, um, at an industrial scale. There are some pilot projects going on um, because what we don't want is to produce toxic nitrogen oxides through the, um, through the combustion of ammonia. We are talking about NOx um, in, a lot of, um, in a lot of areas when it comes to road transport, when it comes to ship transport, and um, if we want to switch to ammonia as an energy carrier to phase out fossil fuels, we would have to make sure that we are not um, we are not going into very high nitrogen oxide emissions. So I've tried to map out a bit the difficulties, but I want to really um, emphasize that we should um, look at um, at ammonia as an alternative fuel for, especially for the sectors which cannot be electrified, such as long-haul transport, shipping, um, road transport even, and we should not rule it out due to the toxic properties, but we must make, um, we must have a, a strategy in order to handle these. I firmly believe that ammonia should be part of the game when we talk about um, alternative fuels, and also I believe that we should, um, that the fertilizer industry should not count on 
selling ever more fertilizers as the nitrogen and phosphorus uh, cycles of the planet are already so much disturbed through our wide application of fertilizers. So it might be a business opportunity for the fertilizer industry to go more into alternative fuels. And I call on you, do some research and development on using ammonia as an energy carrier, be part of the solution. Thank you. Thanks, Jutta. Uh, it's been a, a bit of a long introduction, but it, uh, at least you covered probably most, if not all, of the challenges. Uh, let me turn now to David Herrero Fuentes for some introdu introductory remarks. Go ahead, David. Thank you very much, Fred. Uh, uh, I'm extremely honored to be part of today's panel, and I'm looking forward to discuss about the potential role of ammonia in the energy transition. But first, let me take a first second, a few seconds to introduce myself and the company to the audience. I'm, uh, I'm Spanish, I'm civil engineer by education, and I've been working for Fertiberia for the last uh, 20 years. Currently, I'm the chief operating officer of Fertiberia. Fertiberia is a Spanish fertilizer company running assets in uh, Spain, Portugal, and France. And uh, we are very proud to serve the European agriculture and industry with our innovative range of products and services. We strive every day to develop and provide a smarter and greener fertilizer and producing there in a sustainable manner. Today, going to the point, the fertilizer industry produces and consumes up to 50% of all the hydrogen produced every year in Europe. The hydrogen is further converted into ammonia, which in return is our building block for fertilizer production. Almost 100% of this hydrogen is generated today by the steam methane reforming technology using natural gas as feedstock. For every ton of ammonia being produced by this method, between 1.7 and 2 tons of CO2 are released to the atmosphere. More important, the European industry has already adopted all the energy efficiency measures that are technically available and economically feasible. So we are among the most efficient, among the most efficient industries worldwide. Therefore, Going deeper into the decarbonization means we need whether to avoid emission by changing the feedstock, the green ammonia concept, or capturing them, the so-called blue ammonia. But uh, you will be asking yourself why ammonia is so important for the energy transition. Is it only about its carbon emission intensity for fertilizer production? Decarbonization of ammonia production does not only imply a significant reduction of today's CO2 emissions. Ammonia is a basic carbon and sulfur-free energy molecule. This feature, together with a unique set of properties, enables ammonia as one of the most promising carbon-free energy carriers and fuels for this energy transition. Moreover, and this is an important point, we in the fertilizer industry have a vast experience over 100 years in its safe production, liquefaction, storage, and transportation. Just to give you some data, Every year, almost 20 million tons of ammonia are traded and transported by sea, train, or truck. Finally, there is already a worldwide storage infrastructure and transportation network. There are more than 120 ports worldwide with ammonia storage, being cryogenic, this storage. So I think that this is a very good starting point. As European fertilizer industry, we are excited with this opportunity and committed to play a key role in the development of carbon-free ammonia and low-carbon fertilizer production. Indeed, there is an ongoing effort in developing all the carbon-free ammonia value chain with demonstration projects in several countries, both in ammonia production and in ammonia use. As an example, I can mention the project recently announced by Fertiberia together with Iberdrola in Spain. This project, with a 20 megawatt electrolyzer based on solar energy, will be on a stream by the end of 2021 and we have the potential to replace up to 10% of the total ammonia output of one of our sites. However, to move from demonstration to commercial, we need a decided, firm, and continuous support from the authorities and policymakers. Today, the manufacture of green or blue ammonia is not economically feasible when compared with conventional ammonia. In order to change that and speed up the early adoption by our industry, we need a set of minimum requirements and policies that allows the construction of a solid business case. First, we need to include the role of ammonia in the strategy, roadmaps, and policies for the European energy transition. Second, 
we need to ensure long-term level playing field between European producers and importers. Third, we need to provide enough funds to finance the transition from conventional to carbon-free production. Fourth, we need to make renewable energy and hydrogen abundant and affordable. And fifth, we need to develop the standards and certificates for the production, storage, transportation and use of carbon-free ammonia. If all these conditions are met, we are confident that low carbon ammonia and fertilizer production will become a reality in Europe sooner than expected, creating attraction for other industries to follow and allowing our continent to lead this transcendental challenge. Well, I think that I have spent all the time that I have allocated, so I will be very happy now to discuss with my colleagues and answer to all of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. And let me turn now to Berit Hinneman from Maersk. Thank you very much. And first of all, I'd like to also um, thank you that we can be uh, part uh, of this discussion today, which I think is a very important discussion. And I'd like to introduce um, this from the MERS point of view. I mean, we are one of the largest container shipping companies in the world, operating about 700 container vessels. And we have set the ambitious goal for our operations to be net carbon neutral in 2050. And to reach this goal, we have set a roadmap of 60% relative emission reductions in 2030 before reaching neutral operations in 2050. We also have it as an ambition to have a commercially viable net zero ship on the seas before 2030. We are well underway on this roadmap with 41% relative emission reductions today. And we are actually also the first container shipping company offering CO2 reduced shipping to our customers uh, today through our eco-delivery program. And we will continue to work intensely on energy efficiency measures for emission reduction. But to really reach net zero emissions, we need to transition to alternative and sustainable marine fuels. And to give you an impression, I mean, for us, this uh, transition to alternative marine fuels, it is a huge undertaking. Many of our container ships are 400 meter long, which is more than three football fields. We are one of the world's largest buyer of marine fuels, and we use 10 to 11 million tons of heavy fuel oil each year. For deep sea shipping, energy density, as it also has been pointed out before, um, is a very important parameter for alternative fuels. And after an initial investigation of a broad range of alternatives, we are currently focusing our efforts on biofuels, alcohols, alcohol lignin blends, and on ammonia. We do not consider hydrogen as such as a viable fuel for deep sea shipping due to the low energy density, which makes storage of the required amounts not feasible. But the EU strategy for green hydrogen is of key importance to us since the, available, the availability of the green hydrogen will be key as a feedstock for green methanol and ammonia and other downstream products. Ammonia as a future marine fuel has promising perspectives. It has an energy density that makes it a realistic option for deep sea shipping. As it also has been pointed out already, I mean, for vessel operations, engine safety aspects, there are still developments and issues to be solved. And we do expect good progress on maturing the technology during the coming years, as well as progress on regulatory frameworks. As it was also already introduced, currently most ammonia is produced from natural gas, but for the future we do see much potential for low carbon ammonia, such as uh, especially green ammonia, blue ammonia. I mean, for the economic viability, it is of key importance to close the competitiveness gap. And for this, we see a twofold approach. I mean, on the one hand, reducing production costs by technology maturation and uh, scale up, but we also do see that support schemes for carbon neutral fuels are necessary to close the competitiveness gap until they are cost competitive. And as has been pointed out, I mean, ammonia is already today produced at scale and traded and transported as a chemical. But the use of ammonia as marine fuel as such will exp require expanding the entire value chain from production to transport and bunkering developments in vessels, engines, fuel systems, as well as safety, certification, regulatory frameworks. I mean, we do 
see great possibilities and I'm very much looking forward to discussing this important topic today here. Thank you uh, very much, Berit, uh, for uh, this introduction about the potential of ammonia uh, in shipping. Uh, we can start the Q&A now, and um, uh, my colleagues will launch um, uh, in a moment as well uh, the online poll for the, uh, for the audience. Uh, so we kindly ask you to take a look at that. It's, um, uh, it's a multiple answer uh, questions. So uh, tick the boxes, and then uh, we'll have an opportunity to discuss the results uh, later on. Now, uh, let me start the, the discussion maybe with a fairly basic question to all of you. There's been quite a lot of hype around hydrogen in the past few months, uh, but there wasn't much talk at all about ammonia uh, in this context. Um, at least I haven't heard much uh, about it, even though I was uh, paying attention to that. So why do you think this is the case? Is it simply due uh, to ignorance uh, about uh, the, the properties of ammonia? And uh, Tudor Constantinescu, maybe you can start. Tudor? Do you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, actually, I wouldn't say it was neglected. And if you look at the hydrogen strategy, all the important options for uh, for ammonia were considered. First of all, as I said, is for for the fertilizer industry, and we acknowledge that. And we know that ammonia is, from this uh, perspective, important. It's important for the energy system as a whole because currently, about five percent of the world gas consumption goes in production of ammonia, and uh, also ammonia is responsible for about six hundred sixty million tons of CO two emissions per year, which is equivalent of all CO two emissions of France. So it is significant. It is significant and, and therefore uh, for us is important. And we know that half of the hydrogen produced currently in the world also goes into production of ammonia. Therefore, if we manage to have more renewable hydrogen, we'll have also more renewable ammonia and decarbonize them, what I was mentioning before. First of all, it's, uh, it's uh, about the fertilizer industry, which otherwise may be difficult to decarbonize, but then of course, for the transport, which was uh, also which was also mentioned, and as an energy carrier, and the distances of more than two thousand five hundred kilometers, ammonia becomes maybe the preferred uh, energy carrier to transport hydrogen. Even by pipelines, this uh, becomes more com uh, competitive. And still, the pressure and the temperature at which we have to keep ammonia is something which uh, makes it uh, more attractive. Plus, of course. Uh, the energy density, which is uh, which is better. Now, there are some uh, aspects relating, in particular, to environment, and uh, which were pointed out, and which uh, safety has to be always uh, a priority. But I think we have uh, by now enough uh, enough expertise on this. Now, this being said, I think it was not neglected. It will be definitely an also an alternative fuel for 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 the future. And we look also on a system of guarantees of origin of certification for in particular for renewable and low carbon hydrogen, which should enable to be a, a supportive tool also for ammonia as it will be for other uh, alternative fuels. Yeah. Thank you. And if need is, I can uh, maybe try to find more arguments. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Tudor. Let me turn now uh, maybe to uh, the other speakers, uh, due to Paulus, uh, the reasons you think why there hasn't been that much talk uh, about ammonia. Is it because of all the challenges that you mentioned? Okay, um, I think it's, it's a mixture of, of different things. How long have we actually been talking about alternative fuels? Um, that has not been very long, obviously, especially in those sectors that could be interesting for, for um, using ammonia as a fuel. I'm, of course, talking of shipping again. Um, it was even an accomplishment, so to speak, that in some regions, um, the bunker fuel cannot further be used due to the sulfur and nitrogen oxide emissions. 
and those sectors where ammonia is interesting um, have hardly been addressed in the last year. So the, the search for an alternative fuel um, has just begun and for too long, I think, we have deluded ourselves in thinking that we could use biofuels um, on a large scale, but we have seen what happened with the blending mandates where we have detrimental effects on biodiversity in Indonesia, for example, where palm oil is produced in order to be, um, to be fed to our cars using the, the so-called E5, E10, um, gasoline or E7 um, diesel. I'm, I'm mixing the, the synonyms, I'm, I'm sorry, but still the biofuel delusion has ended just recently, I think, and we still haven't managed to phase those non-sustainable biofuels out. And this will probably not happen until 2030, according to the current Renewable Energy Guideline uh, Directive. So the search for alternative fuels has only just begun. And I think that is the reason why we have not seen so much development there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jutta. So if I understand correctly, the, uh, we, we better get it right this time and, and learn from the past mistakes. Uh, David Herrero Fuentes, maybe a few uh, thoughts from your side. Why do you think there hasn't been that much talk um, until now, uh, maybe, about ammonia as an energy carrier or, or, a, or as a fuel? I think that uh, Tudor and Jutta has, uh, have already pointed out some, some reasons. Uh, ammonia was always there, but uh, to me it's more uh, natural and logical. I mean, uh, we've been developing uh, the hydrogen strategy and uh, ammonia is not in competition with hydrogen. Ammonia comes to complement the, the hydrogen value chain. Is, a, is a, as the title of the conference, the emission link or link that is needed for this hydrogen strategy to happen. And the uh, ammonia will found its uh, terrain in uh, some specific applications. Uh, we are discussing today about uh, marine uh, uh, and alternative fuels and other applications like the carbonization of uh, isolated islands or many, many different applications where ammonia can find its, uh, its uh, uh, used as an uh, energy carrier, a renewable energy carrier. So I think that uh, as long as we develop the strategy and we deploy and implement this strategy and go in deeper into the decarbonization, ammonia will uh, become a reality. Uh, it's not uh, very important that we did not talk very much in the past. Thank you. Thank you. And let me turn now the question to Berit Hinneman. I mean, uh, it seems to be Maersk um, is looking at a, a range of solutions to, to decarbonize uh, maritime fuels. Uh, do you believe ammonia is, is the strongest of the candidates uh, that you're looking at uh, for the moment? We believe that ammonia is uh, one of the strong candidates. But I mean, uh, we are looking at uh, several options, and um, and I think it's it's important to realize. I mean, it is a huge uh, transition, and uh, deep sea shipping. I mean, there is not the silver bullet. There's not the easy answer um, um, or a uh, an obvious candidate where the transition would be easy. I mean, we are looking at uh, ammonia. We are looking at alcohols. I mean, there are. Uh, I mean, some challenges that are across those fuels as to how to uh, get through the transition phase when they will be significantly more expensive. There are also challenges specifically related to ammonia as, for example, uh, safety aspects or um, storage aspects. So, um, so I would say it is one of the candidates. We are uh, pursuing it uh, intensely, but we really have to say how, uh, see how this plays out, and um, uh, and what our feasibility studies show to see um, uh, which options we will pursue in the future. All right. Thank you, Barrett. Um Let's uh, turn now to the, uh, to the online poll uh, that we did uh, with the uh, audience while uh, we were all speaking. 
Um, we asked the audience whether or where they thought ammonia would make most sense. Um, would it be for energy intensive industries, maritime shipping, chemicals, or don't know? Well, 50% um, thought maritime shipping is uh, the area where ammonia uh, holds the most uh, promises. Then energy intensive industries with 20%, chemicals with 14%, and don't know 14%. Um, Tudor, maybe you could comment on that. What are your views about these different uh, choices? Where do you think um, it is the highest potential? Do you think, li like the audience, that transport is, has got the highest potential? Yeah, I, transport definitely has a, a very high uh, potential uh, and offers big uh, potential for ammonia, but uh, not only transport. As we said before, most of the ammonia is currently used in the fertilizers industry and uh, we don't see so many other options. So it's essential for the fertilizers industry. For maritime also it's important and uh, we see a big potential there as well. There are also other applications. Let me tell you also for, for energy storage. And uh, just three uh, big tanks of ammonia of 20,000 uh, cubic meters of, uh, of ammonia could actually store as much energy as 1.8 million uh, batteries, stationary batteries installed in, in homes. So we will need for the future energy system both uh, uh, centralized and decentralized solution. And we know that the distributed generation, the distributed solutions, including on storage, for example, will play a more important role. But we'll need the mix. We need the mix, and uh, from this perspective, ammonia can play an important role as, a, as an uh, energy storage medium as well. So there are a number of applications where we see it playing an important role, and to play this important role, essential is also to bring uh, the cost of uh, uh, green ammonia down, and that means the cost of renewable hydrogen down, and this means reducing capex, but even more important is to reduce uh, the cost of the raw material for this uh, hydrogen, renewable hydrogen, which is uh, electricity price. So it means to have more renewables in place and to be able to produce low cost renewable hydrogen, which is the enabler and which is a raw material in turn for ammonia production and for decarbonizing all these applications and playing a role in the energy system for storage in the carbonizing carbon intensive industries, in particular fertilizers, but also for maritime applications, as, uh, as it was uh, uh, emphasized also uh, by the poll and by the speakers. Thank you. Jutta Polis, uh, let me turn to you now about the areas where you think uh, ammonia has the greatest potential. Do you believe, uh, like the, uh, the audience, that it's, it's maritime? Well, you get a sort of a biased look at um, at different options when you have looking at one sector um, for very intensely for the last month when I was um, working on the on the file on CO two emissions from shipping. So of course, um, my first my first view would be maritime shipping. I'm not sure whether the um, the storage issue is as as important or as viable as Tudor has just lined out. I think the race is still not run. A lot of people are exploring how hydrogen could be stored in, for example, salt caverns, um, well, which we have abundantly uh, all across Europe and which would be probably a lot um, cheaper and also more energy efficient than converting the hydrogen into ammonia first. So yes, I would see it in maritime transport. And um, of course, also in order to replace fossil-based um, fertilizers. But I would like to point out, as this has just been said, that we need lower electricity prices. When you look at newly built facilities, Renewable electricity is already the cheapest electricity that you can get. We have seen prices of below 1.5 cents 
per kilowatt hour in Portugal. In Germany, when you're building a solar plant, um, not on rooftops, but on 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 land, for example, next to to streets or railways, um, we we have we are seeing prices of around four cent per kilowatt hour, and these are all well below any newly built fossil fuel plant already, and um, equaling stock exchange prices for electricity. So I think that's not the main barrier, the price as, as such, but we have to see which obstacles do we have besides the price. And I think that's something that the commission should really look into um, where individual member states have erected barriers for the more, um, in order to prevent a more rapid deployment of renewable energy for different reasons let's put it very diplomatically thank you thanks Jutta. we'll actually look at the barriers uh, that will be the, the the question in our next uh, online poll let me turn before that to david herrero um, do you have views as to which sectors are the most promising when it comes to using ammonia or are you sort of agnostic um, as fertilizer industry about this no, um, I mean, uh, I think that uh, uh, already Tudor has mentioned that which are the, the, the main applications, potential applications for ammonia. One for sure is uh, decarbonizing the fertilizer production uh, based on renewable energy. Second, I would say that uh, marine, maritime uh, uh, transportation and other uh, long heavy transportations are very good candidates. And uh, we will be very happy to share with uh, the industry and with all the value change, uh, our experience in uh, safety, our safety standards and environmental standards to, to avoid any, any incident or, or, or accident. We have a long track record of uh, no, no, no safety incidents regarding that. And, uh, and then the ammonia can be used for sure as an energy carrier. Indeed, when uh, you look at the full uh, um, value chain of ammonia, when it's used as a fuel and you compare it with hydrogen, uh, ammonia is indeed more efficient than hydrogen because uh, we have to consider that uh, when you are using only hydrogen and not converting it into ammonia or other chemical, uh, you are losing a lot of energy in liquefaction or compression in the, and, the, and the, it's uh, used back uh, to energy. So um, there are many potential uh, uses of uh, ammonia, and this is the reason why we think that uh, ammonia can play a key role in uh, the energy transition in Europe and worldwide. Thank you. David, let me uh, bear with you uh, for a second. A question about, um, you know, if we assume that everything goes according to plan in a way and, you know, ammonia gets more and more used for these different types of applications that we've heard, there will be uh, inevitably some uh, interest from, from companies outside uh, your usual world of fertilizers. Uh, maybe some big oil and gas companies uh, will become interested maybe in, in, in investing uh, into uh, that. And they have probably bigger financial means uh, than you have in the fertilizer industry. So how do you see this uh, playing in the, in the coming years? Uh, do you see um, potentially increased interest for ammonia? Do you see this as a brisk um, or more as an opportunity? I mean, uh, uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, today, as Tudor mentioned before, and uh, as I mentioned before, we, we don't have a business case unless uh, we have a, a, a decided support uh, from authorities and policy, policy makers. When we talk uh, about uh, changing and shifting for conventional ammonia to green ammonia, we are talking about uh, very big figures of uh, capex, but also uh, the raw material, the cost of the raw material. And it's not only about uh, the cost of producing renewable electricity in, in a country, it's about all the regulated costs that uh, turns around the electricity, transportation, distribution, and use. So uh, first, we have to have a business case. So we are not in, uh, in that, uh, in, in, at that moment now. For sure in the future, if uh, ammonia becomes a, a, a key a chemical for, for, for energy industry, uh, we will see probably the entrance of other players. 
and uh, to me personal this uh, this will bring uh, many opportunities and for sure some risk that uh, we have to deal with but uh, i prefer that future with no carbon that uh, the current one thank you Thank you, David. Uh, let me turn to Berit Hinnemann uh, now with, well, the, the question that we put uh, actually to uh, the participants uh, online. What do you think are the main uh, barriers currently uh, for ammonia to act as an energy carrier or, or, or as a transport fuel? Is it regulatory certainty or uncertainty? Is it the financing aspect? Uh, is it technical or operating costs? Um, what, what is your view from, from your end? Yeah, I mean, uh, my view is that there are some uh, challenges that uh, hold true for um, several candidates for future marine fuels and also some challenges which are specifically to ammonia. Um, I mean, uh, one very general challenge for this transition is that, um, that also uh, the business case uh, uh, was, was already mentioned in the discussion. And in the beginning, at least, I mean, these fuels, they uh, also um, green ammonia, they will be significantly more expensive than uh, fuel oil. And, uh, and so we have to address how we really can uh, go this transition. I mean, how uh, we are in the process of engaging our customers to go that journey together with us, also uh, investors, I mean, to, to see how we can uh, get that transition to happen. And that is not specific to ammonia. Then there are um, safety challenges. I mean, also questions about uh, vessel technology, the whole bunkering infrastructure needs to be in place. I mean, yes, ammonia, I mean, it is transported in ammonia tankers today. It is also stored at port, but there are still some transitions to go from there to being actually able to bunker at ports and to both have the infrastructure and the uh, technical procedures uh, associated with it. And also on the regulatory side, developments uh, will be needed. So, so we do see a range of challenges and many of the technical and safety challenges that yes, we can make progress and we can find uh, solutions and we have some uh, starting points uh, to do that. But we also do need to address, um, I mean, that how um, these fuels can be pushed out into the market and how we can uh, use it in a yeah technically and commercially viable way. Okay, thank you, Berit. Uh, let me turn to Tudor now, maybe for a quick comment on the results uh, of, of the poll. So uh, according uh, to the audience, the main barrier for green ammonia to act as a hydrogen carrier is technical or operating costs that 41% of those who answered uh, said that was the main challenge. And then just next, um, with 25%, comes the regulatory certainty or uncertainty, and then closely behind the financing uh, aspects. Um, Tudor, what does that uh, inspire you? Um, regulation is a concern, but clearly not the main one, it seems. Yes, I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fair to say that we need to handle all these kind of barriers. And on regulation is where we can act uh, act most, and this is what we are going uh, to do. We need more research on, on a number of cases, and we need also more standards. And this is in the process, and this is what we have to do. Uh, at the same time, yeah, the technical aspects have to be clearly handled, and the aspects related to safety, the aspects related to efficiency, the aspects related to all the conversions, which sometimes are uh, are uh, implied. So we're referring, for example, to, to ammonia as an energy carrier uh, for transporting hydrogen, but we lose uh, energy on both ways. So in the end, we may lose up to 20% in a, or 25% if we have hydrogen compared to ammonia and again hydrogen. So for, for all these things, it's clear we need more uh, efficiency and this means uh, more technology, more research and more demonstration. On the other hand, of course, all the regulatory aspects have to be to be handled, and uh, this is important. 
not only for ammonia, but or uh, the alternative fuels, as it was uh, uh, mentioned uh, uh, before. So it's clear that we enter into a new era, which is more complex, and all these technologies will have to find, and all these fuels and alternative fuels to find their place in the market. And it's a multitude, it's a diversity, which we have not seen before. This makes things maybe a bit more complicated, but we have also to see in what sector, but also sometimes in what regions, what makes more sense, where the business case can be built, where are the biggest opportunities for uh, uh, certain uh, solutions, for certain fuels, and at the end to try, at least at European level, but also globally, to put all these solutions together in such a way that they can uh, deliver and contribute to the overall energy system, to the overall uh, transition. And in terms of uh, financing, because this is was also pointed quite uh, quite important, uh, we'll try on our side to, to support and uh, all the member states and industry to support through research, but also to support in the context of recovery to, to find the most appropriate solutions and also the solutions which will help uh, actually uh, jobs and growth in this period and bring the modernization which is required along the whole energy chain in, in, in this energy transition and which will be important for uh, successfully and having all the consumers, all the citizens on board in the end of the day and all the producers and the consumers at the same time uh, together for the diversity of, uh, of these solutions. So it is uh, understandable and I, uh, the, the, the results of the poll, I, I think, and we have to, to work on, uh, on all of them. Trudeau, let me bear with you uh, just a second, because, um, I mean, you said more research uh, is needed, uh, but uh, time really is of the essence there. I mean, if you look at the, the, the climate change uh, challenge, something needs to be done very quickly. Um, so how does that uh, fit in. Are you expecting anything significant to happen this decade or do you expect the results of the research and all the challenges that we heard to be overcome during this decade and in time for the hydrogen economy really to start uh, kicking in um, after the 2030s? Is, is that basically what the Commission has in mind in terms of the time frame? No, you're right. You're right that the time frame uh, is indeed uh, extremely important. And this is, uh, as I was trying to refer before, the, the essence of the Green Deal, to make these more investments now in order to avoid stranded assets later on, to avoid stranded assets and to avoid blocking effects on solutions which are not sustainable for the future. This is indeed the essence. Now, speaking about particularly about hydrogen, uh, things have evolved uh, during the last couple of years. And it was mainly due to re the research that we succeeded through the programs we have the Commission and run mainly through to the fields and hydrogen general taking to have electrolyzers evolving in the last 10 years from a scale of 10 kilowatts now to 10 kilowatts and one uh, in operation and 20 under construction. And just now for this year, we are going to prepare a call for the first 100 megawatt electrolyzer uh, in the world. So you see, it's, it's a scale advancing very fast, and at the same time, the costs have decreased. So far, in the same decade, the costs have decreased with 60%, and we expect this decrease of cost of uh, electricity to, to decrease uh, equally over the next uh, decade. So there are areas in which we can start now scaling up, and that's why the targets we have in, in, in this respect in the hydrogen strategy with 6 uh, gigawatts by 2024 and 40 by, at least in Europe, by 20. 30. So there is this, uh, this scaling up already taking place, but of course there are other areas in which there is more need for, for research, and uh, in particular on aspects related to safety, security, and environmental, when we speak also about uh, ammonia, but it's on the other hand the fuel which we uh, handle since, uh, since so many years, and there are industries quite experienced, we have to take this in, in, uh, into, advant into account and take advantage of this expertise, Plus, what need is to have the, the standards uh, developed for all uh, the applications where uh, they are not yet developed. But this has to 
go, uh, this process will go in parallel. And where we can already deploy, we have to deploy the technologies. Where there is more uh, need for demonstration, we try to move uh, fast on it in order to deliver for, for, 20, for 2030. And last but not least, of course, in this process, the regulatory framework will have to evolve as well and to reward more the uh, low carbon uh, solutions which contribute to the objective of this uh, trend. Thank you, Tudor. Uh, let me turn to Jutopoulos uh, now for maybe a few words uh, on the time frame aspect. Uh, I mean, as a, as a green politician, uh, you'll be particularly sensitive uh, to, the, to the emergency of tackling climate change. But here we're dealing with a technology where more research is needed. So what are your thoughts uh, there uh, as a politician, as a lawmaker, uh, about the time frame involved? Um. Of course, as a Green, I always say things are moving too slowly and we have to ramp up our, <coughs> our transition, um, speed of transition very much. Um, I would like to shortly come to the regulatory certainty because if, for example, we would say um, we will not have um, bunk of fuel consumption and use in the EU after 2025, or we will have a um, binding quota for alternative fuels with a CO2 emission below so and so much gram, grams per transport work, or however we may put it in, in maritime transport, at a reasonable time frame. I mean, we could not deploy some something like that in 2022. We all agree on that. But if we give industry the certainty that we will only accept um, climate friendly, for example, maritime transport in 10 years, 15 years, whatsoever, then we will actually um, foster innovation and development. Because if we say, well, we're waiting for innovation, then we will start regulating. It must be the other way around. When we start regulating and say, OK, we'll give you a reasonable time frame, but you have to move, then things get going. And I, I firmly believe that the speed can be ramped up. We are, um, for example, when it comes to battery electric vehicles, we have been seeing very low um, numbers for quite a number of years. But um, when you compare, for example, in Germany, the numbers were out last week, one in 100 cars was battery electric in 2018. Two in 100 cars were um, battery electric in 2019. And now we're up to eight in 100 cars being battery electric in 2020. So we're just at the beginning of this growth, exponential growth rate. And I think every technology can be, um, can be fostered and can be supported like that. It, may need support schemes. I agree with um, with Barrett here, but I still believe that by putting strong regulation in place and making it, uh, making it clear to market players, this is what we will accept in 5, 10, 15 years, then we will actually get things moving. And I have great confidence into our researchers and our in, also in our industry to actually deploy the necessary technologies. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jutta. Let me turn the same question now to David Herrero. Uh, do you have any views about the, the, the time frame, the sense of urgency? Do you, do you feel that there's an acceleration um, uh, within your industry uh, in terms of putting together the necessary uh, uh, research or, or investments that are needed to make uh, ammonia uh, happen as an energy carrier or as a transport fuel. I mean, the, the the ambition of the of the of Europe regarding the carbonization demand that uh, we really move very quickly, and uh, I think that it's time uh, moving to commercial and uh, to be very honest, not uh, research or, or 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 demonstration. For sure, research will be done during the commercial escalation of of the different projects. There are different challenges, technical challenges like uh, capex or efficiency that we all will only be overcome once we start implementing uh, more and more uh, uh, green ammonia and green hydrogen capacity. There are other challenges like safety, which is the same 
the, the safety standards already exist and they only have to be adopted and expanded to all the ammonia value chain or the environment where there are already technical solutions, existing technical solutions to tackle the NOx emission uh, coming from ammonia combustion, for instance. So I think that uh, being technical challenges important to, to deploy the hydrogen and the ammonia strategy, uh, having a, a favorable uh, a regulatory framework, not only with restrictions, but with all, also with support and, uh, and, uh, and a strong and enough financial support will be of key importance if you want to have a, a, a enough speed uh, in the adoption of these technologies uh, to, 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 to get to the, our goals in the carbon decision. Thank you. Berit uh, Hidman, maybe a few thoughts uh, on the need to speed up uh, things. What would you say, you know, from, from your side, you said you have these targets for 2030, 2050. Is there anything that could help speed things up? Yeah, I mean, we are speeding things up very uh, much because if we can, if we back calculate from our 2050 and 2030 goals, then that means for us that in the coming years, we really need to uh, get clarity on which uh, uh, fuel options are viable and really uh, uh, push, I mean, run feasibility studies to, to find out how, um, uh, how we can go about uh, realizing that. So, so finding uh, the right solutions and uh, intensifying that work is uh, is very important. And then, um, um, as um, I and others have mentioned, closing the competitiveness gap between uh, the fuels, finding uh, uh, schemes for that, and then also engaging with investors, with our customers. I mean, to to make sure that uh, that we go this journey together. And to make sure that uh, that we can have a vessel on the seas that is net carbon zero and that is uh, commercially viable at the same time. I mean, the, those uh, we see as key measures and as it was pointed out, a key role for regulator, uh, regulators to ensure that these new fuels, that they are really pushed out into the market once uh, they are available and can be used. Thank you, Berit. Let me turn now to um, uh, the audience. Um, um, and I picked up a question uh, there from Daniele Violato. Uh, he's asking um, about ammonia as a fuel to decarbonize aviation. Apparently, Rolls-Royce uh, is working on that. Uh, Tudor, um, we haven't spoken about aviation at all. Is that something the Commission has looked into as well? Look, we are speaking indeed uh, about aviation uh, now, but uh, it is clear that uh, uh, we looked uh, in, uh, in the role of hydrogen for aviation and we started to look into this. And there are already good projects. And for aviation, for the time being, we only have uh, the biofuels and you know, we promote the advanced biofuels, but we we'll need synthetic fuels as well. Synthetic fuels based on hydrogen and this uh, on renewable hydrogen and this is something which uh, we'll have to look uh, also for the aviation sector because uh, uh, there are no many other options to, to, to decarbonize this sector. And uh, again, we'll look at the technologies and at the fields in a way which to be uh, technology neutral, but also to see uh, what fits best and what alternative fields would uh, make more sense. But again, renewable hydrogen will be, if you want, the, the raw material for many of these uh, synthetic fuels. Jutapolis, uh, let me turn uh, to you about this question on uh, aviation. Uh, do you see there some potential? I must admit I haven't seen any studies or technical feasibility um, analysis, so I haven't to be honest, I haven't thought of it. I always thought that aviation would be depending on liquid carriers, which um, can be transported um, in in the air without a lot of risk. And um, especially as we would have to to keep 
hydro uh, to keep um to keep ammonia at under pressure or under at low temperatures i think that that's a real challenge in aviation i've only to be honest I, me personally i have only thought of um liquid fuels like methanol or synthetical kerosene which of course is still much much more um needs much much more energy to be produced and also needs a carbon source so i would be very interested in seeing studies on that because um of course aviation is one of the sectors that that is extremely hard to um to get get uh free of fossil fuels thanks David, Herrero, maybe a few thoughts on, on aviation. Is that something that you've been looking into at all? Uh, aviation, for sure, needs also an alternative fuel with uh, carbon-free. Uh, I think that ammonia could play uh, and be uh, one of the candidates. Uh, ammonia can be liquefied and uh, storage at uh, atmospheric pressure at a uh, moderate temperature of minus 33 degrees centigrade. So, uh, I mean that could be technically feasible to 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 store liquid ammonia in a in a plane and uh, use the boil off and uh, evaporate the ammonia to, to to combust it. So I mean, it's technically uh, can be studied can be studied from the feasibility point of view, and uh, ammonia for sure could be a candidate for aviation. Right. I think we're now reaching, unfortunately, the end of this uh, online conference. Um, maybe we'll close now. I'll, I'll ask each one of you to maybe uh, pick one or two points um, that, or one or two messages that you would like the audience to take away when it comes to uh, the use of ammonia as a potential uh, energy carrier or hydrogen carrier or even as um, a transportation fuel. Uh, Tudor Constantinescu, let me uh, start with you. If you had to summarize your main message today in, may, in, in one or two points, what would it be? I think I also learned uh, interesting stuff today and uh, it's clear that we have a diversity of uh, technology, a diversity of fuels for the future. What is important is to, to have a common low uh, carbon threshold to have a certification in place, to have a system of rewarding the uh, different fuels, uh, including ammonia for uh, green ammonia, for uh, uh, its merits and contribution to decarbonization, and to ensure that there is a level playing field with the more carbon intensive solutions, not to discriminate against the green solutions. So for this, it's important to have this system in place, and it's important to have all the various actors involved this would be something also very important to have the industry, to have the research community, to have the various stakeholders and regulators uh, engaged in, uh, in supporting the most effective solutions where they make most sense and uh, to accept this diversity of, uh, of solutions and to accept that we have to work uh, on all of this uh, together and uh, to make the energy transition not only successful in terms of decarbonization but also in terms of competitiveness and, uh, and affordability. Thank you Tudor. Jutopolis, maybe a few concluding thoughts from your side, what your main message would be uh, today? Well, the main message is, of course, which, which I put it at, uh, as first statement nearly everywhere where I speak, Please stop, um, please stop using fossil fuels when you have renewables that you can really uh, roll out. And the main message should be whatever we are doing to decarbonize at the very first, the very first step must be a rapid deployment of renewable energy such as wind and solar. And we have to make sure that the regulatory framework does not hinder investors to um, get these energy sources running. What I've learned today is that um, much, many more people think about actually using ammonia. And I was very, very glad to hear that industry is actively putting 
some thought and money in this alternative carrier. And I'm also happy to hear that we should really work on regulatory issues and burdens in order to be able to deploy those carriers at market scale. In my view, the easiest way, of course, is pricing fossil fuels, because then you would make um, alternative fuels stemming from renewables uh, market ready, so to speak, by itself. So Nicola Stern has said climate change is the most obvious um, sign of market failure that we have we have ever seen and we should take this to our heart thank you david herrero uh, fuentes uh, the main message uh, that you would like the audience to take away today so ba basically i would like to to insist that uh, the european fertilizer industry is really committed to first decarbonize uh, its own production uh, we also believe that ammonia can play a fundamental uh, role in the global solution for, for the energy transition in, in Europe and uh, worldwide. And uh, we believe that uh, the time of doing it is now. So uh, we really think that uh, we need uh, support from authorities now and we are committed to, 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 to develop and, uh, and go for, for these solutions. And now to conclude, Berit Hinneman, the main message, the main takeaways from, from your side. Yeah, I mean, the main takeaway or the main message from uh, my side is uh, that uh, we are on this uh, journey of uh, decarbonization in the shipping industry and especially for deep sea shipping. I mean, that will be a huge transition. And also it's important to, uh, to see there's no silver bullet there's no easy solution there are several uh, uh, candidate fuels ammonia being one of them and um, as it was also mentioned different fuels for different situations i mean short sea shipping has other solutions available than uh, uh, than uh, deep sea shipping and uh, i think it is important to act now to uh, uh, to to go on the journey to uh, find the right fuels to address those all the challenges that have been uh, outlined today, to uh, close the competitiveness gaps between uh, the fossil fuels and the uh, um, and the net zero fuels, and also to go the journey together with all the stakeholders, as it also has been made clear. Um, and uh, I mean, we are doing that together with uh, our customers, together with investors together with many, many stakeholders. And I think with such a complex transition, I think that is the only way that this will really uh, come underway. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barrett. Um, and uh, I think this wraps uh, today's event. Uh, thanks to Fertilizers Europe for organizing it. Uh, many thanks uh, again to our speakers for joining uh, the discussion today. I hope uh, you all enjoyed it as well in the online uh, audience. Um, well, thanks and bye-bye. Uh, Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.